Hello everyone, Ian Wishart here with another edition of the record-breaking Take A Pew podcast. Wow, how is it record-breaking, mate? Well, Simon, yes folks, that is of course Mr Simon Clark. It's record-breaking because it is the longest-running podcast for which there seems to be no valid justification. Oh, I see. Yes, but that just goes to show how much those Guinness Book of Records people know, doesn't it? Anyway, dear listener, you join us today back down on the south coast of England, this time in sunny Eastbourne. Did you do your research on Eastbourne, Simon? Yes, I did. And actually, I found that there's also a Southbourne, a Westbourne, and a Northbourne, and, and you're not going to believe this, mate. What's that then? Well, they are all in your hometown of Bournemouth. Yes, that's right. I've been to all of those. Which might be wonder whether Eastbourne, although now over 100 miles away, was at one time joined to the Dorset coast. You know, like how South America was once joined to Africa. Well, I think that's unlikely, mate. Or, particularly relevant to our guest today, who originally came from a land down under, it's like how Australia was once joined to Wales. No, I think you've definitely got your continental drift facts wrong, mate. I don't think so. Why, after all, is there a state in Australia called New South Wales? Obviously used to be one and the same. No, that's because Captain Cook sailed past it and thought it looked like South Wales. Oh, I suppose then you're going to tell me now that Belgium was not once part of Greater Manchester. Uh, no. Oh, I hate Wikipedia. Never mind. But I think that the only way out of this ridiculous geological nonsense is to get on with meeting our guest who is none other than evangelist, writer, speaker, filmmaker, podcaster, and director of Christian charity Speak Life, Glenn Scrivener. And yes, Simon, he does indeed originally come from Australia. So let's get on with the show. This is the Take A Pew podcast with Glenn Scrivener. Glenn Scrivener, from Wales. And here we are in the delightful town of Eastbourne. No longer anywhere near Dorset, but in the glorious English county of East Sussex. No connection with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, Harry and Meghan. But I thought if I mentioned them, then some algorithm will probably pick it up and this episode will go viral. Anyway, Simon and I have come to the headquarters of the Speak Life organisation to meet its director, Glenn Scrivener. Glenn, thank you for having us and please take Take a a pew. Thank you very much. Hello, Glenn. It's great to see you. Perhaps you could just introduce yourself to our lovely listeners. Hello, I am Emma's husband. I'm Ruby and JJ's dad. I'm a Church of England minister, but my day job is to work as an evangelist for Speak Life. And uh, yes, I grew up in Australia, but I've lived half my life in the UK. Excellent. Thanks, Glenn. And we are, of course, looking forward to getting a take a few insight into what makes you tick by cantering through all of our regular features, exploring your favourite things, tucking into your fabulous dinner party, getting your input on is it true, and receiving your spiritual pearl of wisdom. And asking you my random question. Oh yes, oh dear. But for now, following our rather disastrous geography lesson, it's time for some history as we delve into the life of Glenn. Where did it all start for you, Glenn? I understand it was somewhere that smelt of cushions. uh, Canberra? Why does that smell of cushions? That's just what I heard. (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah, there's, there's lots of names that you sort of attach to places. Eastbourne's called the Sunshine Coast, which my Australian family thinks is hilarious. <laughs> we have a Sunshine Coast in Australia. It's uh, about five kilometres from the centre of the sun. You can hear your skin audibly crackling there. Not so much in, in Eastbourne. Uh, I grew up in Canberra, which has the smell of cushions. I don't know. It's, it's more known for being the sort of the government centre. Uh, Sydney and Melbourne were fighting it out to be the capital of Australia and they decided to split the difference and invent a town halfway in between. And Canberra is average in every single way. And it's just full of politicians and civil servants and roundabouts. And uh, I got out of there aged about 15. When I actually moved from there, which is basically located in New South Wales, to Old South Wales, and I lived just north of Newport then. What a coincidence. Yeah. Got to go from one Wales to another. So. I am the one holding together. I am like, yeah, I, I, I keep continental drift together. That is, is magnificent. The embodiment of continental drift <laughs> yeah. over the millennia. That's great. And what, what was your family unit like back then? 
So I was the youngest of uh, three kids. My uh, two sisters are nine and seven years older than me, so uh, they would always call me the mistake, and my mother would call <laughs> me the surprise. And uh, yeah, so I was always the, the cute little brother who was just trying to, but, but I was incredibly annoying to my sisters who had much older like friends who were girls, and I, I was not part of their plans. So yeah, I was the, I was the good, sweet, trying to be cute little brother. Nice. And I've, I have a sister who's 12 years older than I am, and she was almost like a, the cool auntie type yes. of thing. Yeah, when my oldest sister moved to Sydney, she, she started university age 17, so I was going up to Sydney very, very um, early on and just fell in love with that city and, and, and just loved... I, I was kind of living the Sydney university lifestyle as like a nine-year-old, which was <laughs> an odd mixture, yeah. Wonderful. Well, that brings us, uh, thinking of those early years, brings us to our first question for you, and that is... What were you like at school? Were you a little bit geeky? Or were you a little bit freaky? Or were you a little bit cheeky? What were you like at school? Yes, Glenn, what were you like at school? It turned on a dime. It turned As soon as I moved from Canberra to Wales, mm. I recognised that in the UK, um, trying is not really rewarded. And being the geeky kid was sort of called out. Like in, in Australia, yes, we had that sort of category for sort of geeky kids, but it wasn't so uncool to actually try hard in school and to read and do the extra credit assignments. And I remember my first day at school in, in South Wales, my second lesson was history, having just done French. And uh, as we waited for the class to begin, I was doing my French homework. And this other student came in and they said, ah, are you doing your history homework? Are you late? I was like, no, just getting ahead on my French homework. And the look I got from this guy, and instantly I recognized it is not cool to try in the UK. And like this other kid said, you know, why are you sitting at the front? And, then, and instantly I was like, okay, it's not cool to sit at the front. And, and when I read my school reports from Canberra, I'm shocked to read that I, uh, I was a, a very geeky kid. I was very um, polite. I was always, you know, getting the hand in the air, trying to answer the questions. As soon as I came to the UK, I recognized that this does not work. And my personality absolutely switched. I started sitting at the back. I started not working. And it's ruined me ever since. Thank really? you so much, <laughs> UK. You have ruined me. But did you have some good mates and friends as a result of that? It's you know, yeah, adapting. I mean, despite that, despite that, despite, that, despite yeah. that, it was weird that. Um, so I, I I applied to to Oxford when um, back when they had uh, Oxford entrance exams because Oxford and Cambridge were sort of too posh to actually receive students who have done A levels. Ooh, A levels. They you know how proletarian. So they had the back in the day they had their own uh, exams. This is back in the 1900s, kids. So <laughs> and they. And, and if you passed their exams, then they would give you a 2E offer to get into Oxford. And so I passed their exams. I, and so halfway, in, in fact, very early on in um, my upper sixth year, I got a 2E offer. I was, I was doing four A-levels and I was told all you need is two E's. And it, it just, again, you've ruined me. The UK is absolutely, and I just played poker. From that time onwards, I never showed up to another lesson again. I, I basically bunked off sort of school and I haven't started working since <laughs> but yeah my poker buddies and joined a band and yeah yeah my studies went out the window and uh, friendship and fun came in and then just taking a step back as it occurs to me that, so did you come over here on your own or with, with the family move over no or? my dad got a job he, okay. was, he was working for the Australian Bureau of Statistics which nice. is probably even more glamorous than it sounds and then <laughs> he worked for the Office for National Statistics which had its headquarters in Newport in South Wales, and so that's why we came over. Okay. Yeah. So as we think back over that, uh, that whole period, we have another question for you, and that is... What's your fondest childhood memory? What's your fondest, what's your fondest of all your childhood memories? What's your fondest, what's your fondest... Oh. Yes. Ben, what's your <laughs> fondest childhood memory, back in Canberra or... Down? I remember, so I came to the UK in 1993 and uh, I actually saw Shane Warne in the Ashes. And if you know anything about cricket, you might know that Shane Warne, his first ball in international cricket against England was called the ball of the century. And it dismissed Mike Gadding, who was the English great hope against spin bowling. 
And it was just absolutely phenomenal. And I, I showed up to school literally the next day and I said, I'd like to play cricket. They said, what do you do? I said, I'm a leg spinner. Uh, total lie. I had absolutely no idea <laughs> how to bowl the thing. But I sort, of, I sort of figured out how to do it. And I just loved playing schoolboy cricket. And I think probably my favorite schoolboy memory was uh, hitting the winning runs, a six in the last over to, to win a game in this cup competition. And uh, yeah, that's, that's when, when the head hits the pillow and I, I try to go to my happy place. It's, it's that place. Marvellous. Yeah. What about back in Australia? Any memories stick out from there? I remember, so Canberra, this surprises people because uh, Canberra is closer to the skiing than it is to the surfing. So we're, we're actually quite high up in Canberra and we're the only inland city. So I, I do remember a, a ski trip. So as I said, my sister, my, my oldest sister was much older and she'd have friends from Sydney down. They come to Canberra and come back through for the, the ski fields. And I remember going skiing with her friends uh, that day. And again, that, that was a really, a really happy time. Lovely. So back to the, uh, there you are playing poker, not doing any work whatsoever, yeah. preparing to go up to Oxford. <laughs> up to Oxford. <laughs> was, um, was God on the radar at this point? Well, I was a good kid, as I've said, and my mum's a great believer. And, uh, and so, yeah, church going was, was a part of things. And I remember going to youth group type things and giving my life to Jesus about a thousand times. <laughs> and I don't think that's an exaggeration. In fact, you know, one of the poems I've done and one of the videos we've done for, for Speak Life is called, I gave my life to Jesus about a thousand times. <laughs> I went to this sort of camp thing, age 14, and it was very melodramatic. And the, and the preacher was telling me to give my life to God. And so I, you know, tried to as best as my teenage self could. I sort of drummed up the melodrama within me to do that. And then I went back to the cabin where we were staying. And I, I remember going into the, the um, bathroom and flicking on the light above the mirror. And I don't know what I was looking for. I think I was looking for a halo above my head or a, you know, a funny shining light within me. And I didn't get any of that. And so what did I do? I prayed again. And then I prayed again. And then I prayed again. And then I prayed again. And I remember in my teenage years, the Garden of Gethsemane was um, this haunting passage from the Bible. It's the time where Jesus, the night before he dies, goes into a garden and prays about the cross that he's about to undergo. And he calls it a cup of suffering. And, and will he embrace the suffering of the cross? And he says, my, your will be done, God. And I, I remember thinking to myself, this was back in the day when there were the WWJD bracelets. You know, what would Jesus do? Well, Jesus would go into a scary wooded place and offer his life to God. And so that's what I tried to do a thousand times. I would, I would volunteer to walk the dog into this scary place in a forest where, near where we lived. And at times I would press my face into the dirt and say, God, take me, use me, your will be done. And never got the sort of the spiritual dopamine hit that I was looking for. And so once you pray that prayer 800 times, 900 times, like, how are you starting to feel about God? I, even though I was the good kid, I think I hated God. I really do. Well, I, I felt God. like, yeah, I felt like I was knocking on heaven's door and he wasn't there or he was hiding behind the sofa, you know, wishing I'd go away. And I kind of did. So I, I went to Oxford and I tried to have as good a time as I possibly could, possibly could without God. So that was, that was sort of my, yeah, my prodigal sort of years. Okay. How did that change then? Cricket. I, um, I was desperate to play for Oxford against Cambridge because if you play in that game, you play at Lords, the home of cricket. And so I was desperate to get, and, and I fell agonizingly short of playing in that varsity match. I played, you know, for the first, until that game and, and I got dropped. And, um, some people say you never look up until you're flat on your back. And, uh, for me, I was floored by this, you know, I look back now and I think, oh, that's, that's a little dramatic, Len. <laughs> it's just a game of cricket. He's just chasing a little red ball around a green field, but it meant everything to me. And so flat on my back, my friend invites me again to church. And like, this is three years in a row. He's inviting me to church. I'm saying, no, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. And I went and I hated the preacher so much. So, because he thought he was so cool with his contemporary illustrations from EastEnders <laughs> and things. Like, what do you know, idiot? And I, but I found myself going back again the next week to hate him some more. And it became a hobby of mine to sort of hate the preacher, which is funny now, because that's my job. I'm now the preacher and I look at the, the kids at the back folding their arms, you know, angry at me. And I think you just wait, buddy, you just wait, it'll happen to you too. And, uh, and by the end of that year, I actually made the decision to go back to Australia, which was a, an 
odd decision to make from any earthly point of view, but really back in the back of my head, I was thinking I'll throw myself into church in Australia, make a fresh start. And I met Jesus there uh, in Sydney uh, in, in about the year 2000 in the most extraordinary way, just opened up the gospels and just seeing from the gospels, the person of Jesus, I just saw his towering personality, his stooping love. And I thought, ah, if it's about him, I'm in. And I guess I've been kind of shooting my mouth off about him ever since. <laughs> Wonderful. I didn't, I didn't realise Jesus had been to Australia, actually. <laughs> so that was about the time of the Olympics, I guess. Did you, 2000, yeah, it was big, big. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and the, the Millennium celebrations. Did you get and, along to all of that? You know, I, actually, I then came back to, to oh, right. London. Um, so by, by the Olympics, by summer of 2000, um, I decided that, uh, yeah, I was, I was going to dive in with both feet with the Jesus thing. And wow. I got a job, basically cleaning the loos at uh, All Souls Langham Place, which is a sort of famous church in the center of London where John Stott was preaching for many, many years. And so, uh, yeah, they, they were looking for people basically to kind of polish the brass and hoover the floors. But you got to have lunch with John Stott and spend time with all these other Christians. So that was absolutely formative for me. Yeah. yeah. So you were fully on board, obviously, at this point. It had been a, at this a point, yeah. profitable trip to, uh, to Australia, <laughs> which, yeah. is, which is wonderful. Um, and then you... I mean, you worked in London for a while then, didn't yeah. you? And you get it fully involved in, in a church? Well, then I got deported, but... Um, oh, okay. so, <laughs> <laughs> I thought there was an intimation that something had happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, you know, as with my ancestors, so with me. I you know, had, to, had to leave <laughs> the mother country with uh, you know, legal threats over me. So, um, but was that just because you were a Christian at that point? Or? No, it was, it was just because I was... Um, uh, all sorts of mess, mess ups with the home office and immigration. Um, but I just started to get together with this girl called Emma and uh, we were just friends at the time. But uh, when I get deported back to Australia, we start emailing each other and we start doing this thing called Microsoft Messenger, <gasps> which all the kids were into with our dial up Wi-Fi. And that sort of uh, grew and grew to the point where I'm an Australian male, so I'm not really in touch with my feelings. But at, at some stage, after months and months and months of just writing for hours a day to this one other girl, and she must have been writing for hours a day, at some point the penny drops and I send her an email saying, uh, sit down there, right? I, I think, I think I love you. I think, yeah, I think I do. <laughs> um, and I sent that email and having emailed each other at least like once a day, often twice a day for the last six months, she leaves me hanging for 48 hours, Ooh. you know, that's, it, it, which I've forgiven her for, obviously, and, <laughs> and there's no hard feelings, but that's a long time, don't you think? And, but then she, like, cool as you like, sort of comes back to me and says, uh, yeah, I feel the same, but uh, you don't have a visa, so it's your call, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and God just opened doors, and uh, yeah, eventually I came back to London uh, with a fiancé visa, and I worked for a church, and uh, the rest is history. And you did, I mean, you mentioned you're a Church of England minister. Mm. Um, so you actually did do the ordination thing. Yep. Yep. Um, Went to Vicar Factory. Yep. Nice. Yep. Okay. Was that an obvious choice for you? <sighs> no, not really. Uh, but it was sort of the conveyor belt that I was put on. And I, and I think so much, the, the church doesn't really know what to do with creative people, doesn't really know what to do with evangelists. And the only thing it knows to do is to put you on the conveyor belt to the Vicar Factory. So I went on the conveyor belt to the Vicar <laughs> Factory um, and, you know, um, learnt a lot about the Bible and learnt, learnt um, some things about preaching and found myself as the curate of All Souls Eastbourne, uh, which is where we are now. And uh, by the time my three years as curate sort of came to an end, I was faced with a choice. Do I want to become a grown up and take a church of my own? Um, well, at that point, uh, this charity, the, this building where we're sitting in right now, um, they were looking for an evangelist and I applied to get that job back in 2010. And so even though I'm ordained in the Church of England, uh, my job with Speak Life frees me up to go around and shoot my mouth off about Jesus everywhere uh, and has delivered me from vicardom, which, uh, which I'm grateful for. Yeah. <laughs> vicardom. Yeah. Like yeah. Yes. So are you, st are you still past the Church of England or how does that work? Or I have permission to officiate right. uh, in the diocese yeah. and, uh, and we'll see what happens with the Church of England. Very nice. Yeah. So you're obviously a busy chap mm. these days. I mentioned at the top all the, the various fingers in various pies, pies that you have. So what's the main focus of your ministry right now? 
Well, we, we really want to equip Christians to share their faith and to share their faith naturally. And so everything we do is aimed at that, but we do lots of different things to do that. So we've got a YouTube channel and we're putting out three videos a week and we've got podcasts and we've got uh, books um, that, that I write and uh, my colleague Nate Morgan Locke writes. There's lots of speaking engagements. I was just up doing a student mission for uh, Durham University and we sort of hired out a massive marquee in the center of where all the students are and for a week we're just sort of preaching the gospel and seeing people come to Jesus. But everything we do, the, the passion is really um, to equip Christians to share their faith. So our, our, our big strap line is love Jesus, share Jesus. Because uh, Matthew 12 verse 34, Jesus says, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So I, I'm not into hotboxing Christians and guilting them into being evangelists. I'm more into wanting to fill their heart with the good news of Jesus so that they just do bubble over with w words of witness. Yeah, it's interesting. So, how, the, so you talk about equipping Christians. How much do you see yourself as communicating with Christians and how much with, Christ with people who are not yet yeah. Christians? Yeah. It's interesting, there's, there's a part of the Bible in, in Ephesians, uh, in the New Testament, chapter 4, it, it talks about evangelists and it says that they've been given to the church to equip God's people for their works of service. So normally when we think of an evangelist, we think of somebody who's done with the church, <laughs> kind of walking away from church and they're going out into the culture to, to preach and there's a time and a place for that. But I think biblically uh, a healthier vision is that the evangelist actually faces the church for a lot of the time, to equip the real evangel, the real missionary body in the world is the church. You know, Jesus says, you know, by this all people will, will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. And so like the church being built to be the church is the great evangelistic witness. And I think evangelists have been given to help the church to be evangelistic. So I do, I, you know, most of my books are evangelistic, but the first person who's going to buy that book will be a Christian who will read it and pass it on to their mates and, and on it goes. And it's and social media is the same, isn't it? Like what you like, you share. And so um, it goes viral in that way. And I think the gospel is supposed, supposed to go viral in that way, that as I talk about Jesus in a likable way, you start to like him more and what you like, you share. So even our social media, um, yes, it's evangelistic, but probably the first person who's gonna consume that content is the Christian who then likes, shares and subscribes and out it goes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you should say there's, a, there's certainly, it, it's a prolific output, I think mm -hmm. from Speak Life and from you, mm -hmm. but um, is there any part of that that you enjoy more than any others? At the moment I'm doing, I'm writing. So I, I, like, I yeah. like the whole thing. I like all of it. I'm a plate spinner. And so Speak Life re reflects the, uh, the shadow side of its leader. <laughs> the shadow <laughs> side of its leader is, I just love spinning a million different plates. And if the kitchen goes on fire, I'm gonna distract you by spinning three more plates. And say, don't look at the kitchen, look at my plates. Um, so I'm always doing something new. At the moment, what I'm loving doing is writing. I, I think the, the one common passion that binds together uh, most of what I do is words. So where do your ideas shows. come from for, for books? Do they sort of suddenly you just wake up one morning with an idea and right, I'm going to write about that? I think Stephen King has a really good um, uh, kind of theory on that. So Stephen King, obviously prolific writer and, and wrote things including The Shawshank Redemption and It. And, but he says um, ideas are a bit like fossils that you find and you're an archaeologist mm -hmm. and you, 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 your foot kind of kicks something. Oh, that's a little bit odd. And, you know, and, and he had the idea for the Shawshank Redemption. You know, what, what, about, what about a guy who's in, in prison and he looks, like he's, um, he looks like he's a model prisoner and actually he's burrowing out of the thing the whole time? Plot twist, right? And, and so that's the idea. That's, that's, that's the, the kernel of the idea. But there's a whole bunch of mess and dirt and detritus around that fossil of an idea. And actually creativity is getting rid of everything that's unnecessary to that idea and just getting it back to its, its purest sort of form. And I, I really like that because Stephen King says um, creativity is not like architecture where you build something from scratch. It's more like archaeology where there is, there is just a thing already and you want to wrestle with that thing that's already there and, and get rid of the stuff that's around it. It's mysterious. I don't know why that thing is there. Well, I do because, you know, God is the creator and he's made us to be creative and he's woven meaning into the fabric of the universe. So, of course, there are fossils of, of, of meaning in the world. But I, I, think it, I think it's just such a mystery of why, yeah, you're in the shower and you have an idea. <laughs> 
I don't know. You know it's a great course. analogy. I like that. We've been called fossils sometimes. <laughs> yes, a lot of the time. A lot of the time. It's just one thing I wanted to um, part of the the output I wanted to talk about is three, two, one. Yeah. Uh, which is a book, and yep. it's also a course. Do you want to yep. just tell us a little bit about that? Because it's well, that I mean, that was an idea that came to me in the bathroom. Uh, three, two, one. Basically, I'd just written something where somebody said, if I was going to explain the Christian faith, I would use one, two, three, four, and I forget what all those numbers kind of referred to. But what I wanted to do was start a presentation of Christianity that begins with the Trinity, okay, the Father, Son, and Spirit. Because like in the ancient church, Trinity is front and center. Like all the creeds, when, all they're, ex when they're explaining who is God, like Father, Son, and Spirit is kind of front and center in what they do. And so I was thinking, well, if you were gonna start with three, I guess you'd have to count backwards, wouldn't you? So it'd be three and then two, what would two be? And again, I think for 2000 years, uh, Christians have really wrestled with the splitness of humanity. That um, there is life as it's meant to be and there's life as it actually is. And life as it's meant to be is represented by Jesus. Life as it actually is, is represented in the Bible by Adam, right? And so th this idea of, of humanity is shaped by two representatives. Adam represents life as it is in its selfishness and, and cursedness and mortality. And then life as it's meant to be is represented by Jesus. So three, the Trinity, two, Adam and Christ. And then one, we're born one with Adam, be one with Jesus. And literally that was an idea I, I had in the shower 13 years ago. And it was first a blog post and then it was a video and then the video went viral and then it got translated into a dozen languages and then it was a book and then it was a course. And uh, what we really wanted to do is um, make it into a resource that's that's very digital friendly um, so you can do it online with a friend you can do it online alone or you can do it in person and i want to evangelize christians because i don't think christians think about trinity or adam and christ or union with christ historically christians always have done and i think we've we've boiled our gospel down into this anemic sort of thing so i want to evangelize christians first and get them excited about the fact that god is love i want to get them excited uh, about the fact that Christ is the second Adam and our champion and he does it all for us. I want us to get excited about union with Jesus because I think that's the foundation of the Christian life. So first of all, let's get all Christians doing three, two, one. Then let's get their neighbors and friends to come along and do it. Let's roll it out. Let's see a gospel revolution. Well, it's, uh, let's hope it does that. Mm. Be wonderful. So um, you, you mentioned Ruby and JJ. Yep. Uh, I guess they take up a lot of your time. <laughs> yeah, what else do you like to do to uh, relax? <laughs> that's it. That's <laughs> it. Yeah. Yeah. I've just described everything. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do I do still like to play cricket when I can. Do you I get play, to do that? Yeah. Not very much. Yeah. So I mean obviously it takes forever to play and uh if you're kind of working six days a week and you take the other day off to <laughs> drive around the country and then play cricket, which you know usually takes up about fifteen hours of the day, you don't become very popular. No, right? no. So I, I I usually play about three or four games a season. And that that sort of does me, and that's that's pretty much all the spare time I have. Yeah. <laughs> Still play a bit of poker. <laughs> I love a bit of poker. I do love a bit of poker. I mean, I, I used to play till I couldn't tell red from black anymore. It was, it was just <laughs> that's uh, that's kind of weird. Anyway, well, <laughs> <laughs> you're not wrong. You're not wrong. <laughs> it's uh, well, it's pretty exhausting just hearing about everything you do. Never mind doing it. Yeah. So I'm pleased to report that the kitchen is standing by oh. for your fabulous take a pew dinner party. But they will have to wait just a little longer because it's time for us, of course, to play the delightful game we call My Favourite Things. My Favourite Things. Yes, Glenn, this is a very easy game. We give you a number of categories and you just have to tell us your favourite thing in each. Oh, wow. Okay. Spectacularly simple. Our first category is always your favourite book of the Bible. Oh, probably the one that I've just ended up spending most time in recently, which is John's Gospel. Um, it, it changes all the time, but John is amazing. Yeah, I love it. Perfect. If you had to go Old Testament? Genesis. Yeah. Oh, it, it, just extraordinarily. It's, it's just like walking into a cathedral, isn't it? When you, when you get into Genesis, this expansive view of creation, God and the history of Israel. And, yeah, love it. Brilliant. Okay, your favourite plant? <laughs> um, I do like eucalyptus trees. And whenever I fly back into Sydney, 
you just notice like how sweet the air is. There's just millions. It's it's it just mentholates the breeze. It's it's like this cough mixture carried upon the wind to to you, and it, it makes Australia smell amazing. So, wow. How about that? Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, great choice. Yeah. Yes. Okay. A third category is always your top five films, your favourite oh, movies gosh. of all time. Well, the trouble with having kids is that a you've got no time for films. And then B, all your favorite films from pre-kids you've forgotten about because you've got, you've got baby brain. But um, I think The Big Lebowski might be my number one. Okay. So as a, a comedy, the, the Coen brothers, Jeff Bridges, John Goodman is just yeah. hilarious, amazing. It's Steve Buscemi is just fantastic. Um, I would go Magnolia, um, okay. Paul Thomas Anderson. Yeah. That's... that's the We've second time before, it's come up yeah. on the show. Who actually. else? Who else likes? I think it was a it was a rector from Sheer in Surrey called Tim Heaney. Okay, who's a massive, massive film buff. Right. Um, and he chose that's um, Tom Cruise. Yes. 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 He's actually yeah. He's yeah. you you actually allow yourself to like Tom Cruise in mm. that film because he <laughs> plays who you imagine him to be, which is a bit of a cad. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Great. I'm going to have to watch that now. Yeah. yeah. And uh, okay. oh, and, and another. Uh, P.T. Anderson film Punch Drunk Love um, uh, with oh who's the comedian uh, who was in Happy Gilmore and uh, uh, Adam Sandler, Adam Sandler yeah. but he but he pl he's not playing a, a comic role and and I think I think I like it because he's got lots of older sisters and he's he's kind of put upon as this younger brother who doesn't have a voice <laughs> so I do like Punch Drunk Love uh, <laughs> as an Australian I've got to say The Castle which if you haven't seen The Castle you'll you'll laugh your head off and you'll learn so much about Australian culture it's it's uh, this heartwarming story about a family whose house is there is about to get requisitioned by the government so that they can extend the airport and it's an allegory for what happened with our Aboriginal land rights and so um, and so yeah it's it's kind of a parable of, of what uh, unfortunately you know we did to Aboriginal communities and what they what they end up doing is finding the services of this amazing QC who argues their case in in law, and he, and it's the triumph of the little guy over the horrible corporation. It's incredibly funny. It makes it makes fun of every kind of Australian uh, stereotype you've ever you've ever heard. So <laughs> you you, like you probably you, you'd laugh at it, and I'd laugh with it. But um, how many is that? That's four, I think. That's four. Yeah. four. What, what what else will I go for? Um, very arty yeah. i mean in a good way is so that far. right yeah. I, so, yeah I i went and watched pulp fiction again the other day <sighs> oh, yeah, that. yeah yeah that's a spicy one yes, yes. yeah yeah i remember yeah. i i saw it at the cinema aged 16 when it first came out and uh i was in london with my friends watching pulp fiction and the world seemed incredibly <laughs> dangerous and fun and full of possibilities so yeah pulp fiction has a has uh, quite the place in my heart yeah okay view on crocodile dundee one word you have one word one answer uh, bon bonza <laughs> brilliant perfect okay. okay great great selection yeah. there well done thank really you yeah. okay <laughs> So now, well done, he says, Mac now. <laughs> very good, well, well done. Okay, very well done. Yeah. Square yeah. Top marks. <laughs> Don't sit at the back of the class now. <laughs> yeah. Now, our penultimate category um, is, as always, dedicated to what we call the Great Eight. So, our patented selection of quickfire categories, which reveal the inner workings of the soul. Really? What? No, no, not really. They're just fun. <laughs> just fun. Indeed. <laughs> so, here we go. Eight quickfire categories. Starting with your favourite book or author. Favourite book or author. Um, I've just read uh, the first book by uh, Mary Harrington called Feminism Against Progress. And it's, uh, it's astonishing. It's just, her, her writing is um, like she, call, she talks about, and I don't expect anyone to understand this, even Mary Harrington herself. But she says, <laughs> we live in a world of meat Lego Gnosticism and cyborg theocracy and bio libertarianism has liquefied human bodies and embodied living. And it's just like, oh, wow. It's like mainlining some narcotic. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. That's I'm going to have to research yes, all of that, that, I think. <laughs> Favorite type of food? Thai. Okay, good. Favorite TV program? Oh, ever? I'm really enjoying Succession and I can't wait for the next season to come out. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's great. I, I do like that. It's a bit sweary, isn't it? Sure. Famously. Oh, sure. Yeah. Very, yeah. very nice. <laughs> oh, well, if you think back, do you have a favorite TV program of 
yesteryear. Of, of yesteryear. I mean, the IT crowd or anything by Graham Linehan, Father Ted, IT crowd. That's just awesome. Nice. Favorite sport? Cricket. Easy. Obviously easy. Favorite band or artist? Uh, if I have to pick one, Radiohead. Yeah. Favorite holiday destination? Uh, my sister has a house on Hamilton Island, just off the Queensland coast. It's the southern tip of the, uh, the Great Barrier Reef. It's 25 degrees, morning, evening, winter, summer. It's just, it's gorgeous. Sounds it's gorgeous. amazing. What a great, a great choice. So much better than Margate, <laughs> yeah, swim, which, which was, has yeah. been a very popular choice yeah, on the right. show. Uh, okay, nearly there. Favourite chocolate bar? Toblerone, all day long, oh, no. all day long. Made I mean, that's, what, what else do people answer? That's the only answer. That is, it? yeah, yeah, correct answer. Triangular honey from Triangular Bees. Oh, I, yeah. I, I always think of there's an Alan Partridge line. <laughs> he, he went on to Jonathan Ross and he starts talking about like how he gained something like 10 stone. And, uh, and, <laughs> and um, <laughs> Jonathan Ross said, you know, how did you do it? And uh, Alan Parcher says, I became medically addicted to Toblerone. <laughs> and I just think about that line the whole time because it's, it's, yes. it's clearly possible to get medically addicted to Toblerone. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. <laughs> There's that horrible image, isn't there, of him stuffing Toblerone into his mouth. <laughs> <and he's gone. laughs> Terrible. Uh, understandable. Though. We've all been there. Yeah, we've all been there. Favourite board game? I don't, yeah. Mm. Not the biggest fan of board games. I like card games. That's my yes, no, no. <laughs> Um Oh, I don't know. I hate Monopoly with a passion. Does this count? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's that's just even go. better. I think. Yeah. yeah that's, whatever that's is it. the anti-Monopoly. I just hate it. <laughs> yeah. Like, what is the point? It, it goes on forever. And does anyone is anyone happy with winning? Like, no one's no one's happy with losing, but no one's even happy with winning. No, not really. Dreadful okay. game. No. Let's go. I, I like going, taking this podcast on a more negative tangent. Yeah, that's right. What? And we should have my least favourite things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That would be I like quite, there needs to good. be more hatred in yeah. podcasts. I really, really hate. That would be yeah. quite a yes. different dynamic, the wouldn't it? The cortisol network. We just, we're just going to pump people full. Your least favourite member of your family. <laughs> <laughs> Me. For example. <laughs> okay, our final category on my favourite things is always multiple choice. So I'll give you three possible answers. And Glenn, we're here in Eastbourne, so we'd like to know your favourite Bourne. Three possible answers, <laughs> not necessarily the ones you might be expecting. Iconic action movie hero Jason Bourne. Obviously. Iconic Bruce Springsteen song Born to Run. Right. Or Borneo. <laughs> <laughs> your favourite Bourne. Because, um, I mean, Bruce Springsteen was also um, famous for Born in the USA. Which we had that on the radio the other day. Of course, yes. Yeah. Two Born in the USA, and it was on in the radio, and I'd forgotten how often he like sings that one line, "Born in the USA." And my daughter from in the back seat says, "Bro, we get it. You're born in the USA. <laughs> not that impressive." <laughs> and she was absolutely right. You know, not that impressive to be born in the USA. So I'll have to go for Jason Bourne. Yeah, Jason Bourne. Yeah, excellent. Of whom Simon had never heard until yesterday. What? Oh, Isn't that bizarre? It's not too embarrassing in front, the, in front of our dear listeners. <laughs> yeah, it's just too. Gosh. So this is this is the second time you've heard of him. So, the second time. Yeah. So I'm born again. Check him out. I'm going to look him up. Yeah. Born again. Born again. Born again. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Hey. We're going to have to we're going to have to include that bit now. Are we? That's, That's brilliant. Good. Yeah, you were going to delete that, weren't you? The best. I was. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I don't think we can really fault any of those answers, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings us rather hungrily to the dining room because it's the fabulous take a beer dinner party the miraculous take a beer dinner party the food is quite irrelevant and some of the guests are on it's the impractical fantastical take a beer dinner party <clears throat> <laughs> Yes, Glenn, this is your chance to host a fabulous, miraculous dinner party. As ever, a quick reminder of how it works. You can have as many friends and family as you would like, but there remain four empty chairs. Yes, and you have to fill three of those chairs with someone from any time in history, or indeed still going today, a cartoon character, and a non-domesticated animal. <laughs> and then on the final chair, there is a gramophone player which will play the single piece of music of your choice throughout the dinner. All in all, a pretty standard arrangement, I'm sure you'll agree. So, Glenn, let's get this party started. 
Your first choice. The person who you would choose from today or yesteryear. And remember, it can't be anyone who appears in the Bible or any of your family. Right. Um, I've changed my mind. I, I'm going to go for Winston Churchill, even though many Australians would disown me for that. But um, <laughs> yes, he's, he wasn't, he, he's not the most popular character in Australia for some of the decisions he made, especially around World War II. But yes. um, what a raconteur and what experiences he'd have. And I, I love that bit. Um, he was famous for... Uh, at a dinner party, a woman was shocked by the things that he was saying. She said, she said uh, Sir, if you were my husband, I'd poison your tea. <laughs> to which he responded, Madam, if you were my wife, I'd drink it. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I like that. I, like that. <laughs> I think he'd be a wonderful dinner party guest, wouldn't he? Yeah. Really good. He was so good. You'd have that cigar smoke fug going on, wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah. Fuck, uh, that's a good yeah, that is right. yeah. Okay, so we've got the old, uh, old Winnie. Uh, yeah. So then you secondly, a cartoon character. I grew up on The Simpsons, so uh, who would I... Homer? I mean, it's just got to be Homer. Nice. All, I mean, a line from Homer Simpson occurs to me on at least a daily basis. So, mm. yeah. And good. apart from the, perhaps the skin colour, hmm. it would be easy to confuse Homer with Winston. Right? It might be, actually. Yeah. Fairly similar, aren't After they? a few clarets, yeah. you might get yeah. a bit confused and yeah. yes. ask... Homer Simpson about Suez politics and that sort of thing. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Interesting. That's a great choice. I'm amazed no one has chosen anyone from The Simpsons before. That's Seriously? Well, it's the obvious answer. Seriously? Really. Oh, gosh. Okay. Very good. Okay. Yeah. What about a non-domesticated animal? Um, I mean, my first thought was a tiger, but I don't want a tiger to get oh. get in among Winston. That would be, mm. yeah, carnage. Carnage, yeah. yeah. Um, non-domesticated animal. Yeah. And the... What do people generally go for? In, in well, we've point? had a sloth, a hedgehog, okay. a hedgehog, uh, uh, a we calf. Did, we did have a calf, which yeah. is a strange choice, I think. Yeah. Okay, I, I could say koala. I was, I was <laughs> just, <laughs> yes. I was just, as I said, I was up at Durham University, and the students were sort of uh, interviewing me before I spoke, and they did a "Would I lie to you?" thing, which you, you, you know, the yes. David Mitchell and and uh, all, all that lot, and. Um, and so they just handed me this piece of paper and I was supposed to be the person who read out the, the fact about myself. And the fact that they fed to me was, I once killed a koala with a cricket ball. <laughs> and then they How's passed... that? Ah, oh, good one. Um, <laughs> and then they passed, they passed the microphone. And there's, there's literally like four or five hundred people there. And they passed the microphone among, amongst the crowd and they had to ask me questions about... <laughs> and then I must have to make stuff up on the Nightmare. spot. Nightmare. And and then at the end they had to vote on like did they think I was a liar or not? And we got to the point where basically the whole room was split on thinking half the room thought I was a liar, half the room thought I was a koala killer. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've got to preach the gospel. <laughs> People needed to think this thing through a little bit more. <laughs> so we go with a koala. Yeah, anyway. koala sort of Let's life. go for a koala. Which is, which is rather nice, I think. I mean, we... they sleep for 22 hours a day. Oh, so. that's perfect. Yeah, there is yeah. a theme emerging as, as this feature matures slightly mm. of, of the least impact that animals could have because you don't really want them right. there in the first place. Yeah, if you're going to say sloth, say koala. But a, but a koala, what I like about a koala, because do they eat eucalyptus? They do. Only yeah. eucalyptus Only, and yeah. they don't drink. Yeah. So you'd have to get in a load of that, which yes. would then fill the room with the Call scent. Back. Callback of you. Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. Be magnificent. Amidst the fug of the uh, yeah. cigar smoke. Yeah. What a so, great combination. It's yeah. just, <laughs> cigar and menthol. It's quite yeah. a heady mix already, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's wonderful. And the music in the background would be. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. So it's just one, just one, one, piece, one piece of music. Yeah. Well, well for, for length, um, you'd just have to go Bay Holmes the Ninth, wouldn't you? So that's, that's okay. about yeah. 80 minutes, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Did you know the CD? The, the, the length of a CD was basically attuned to the length of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Wow. Because okay. they, they thought they, they could have made it much larger, they could have made it much smaller. They went with 80 minutes because of Beethoven's Ninth. There you go. Wow. That's, Bit of trivia. Every day is a school day, isn't it? Fascinating fact. That is. Every yeah. day is a school What's day, a fact, as you say. It's a, that's <laughs> brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Very good. I, I think it sounds absolutely wonderful. We hope that you get to enjoy such a dinner party before too long. Um, and with that, it's time to complete our look at the Chronicles of Scrivener, as we ask you... Twelve years from now, what would you like to be doing? Or would it mainly be the same? Or would you rather be canoeing for a summer? 
Yes, just an example. <laughs> so <laughs> there's no resolution. Where's the resolution to the theme? Oh. Uh, so yes, Glenn. What would you boom, like us to? Boom. Do? <laughs> I didn't have to do it. I didn't have to do it. Yeah, you got to do it. You've Life do couldn't it. go on. Yeah. Yeah. Bom, bom. <laughs> so Glenn, what would you like us to be talking about if we were having this conversation with you twelve years from now? I'm just very happy kind of doing mm. what I'm doing. I, the, the scary thing is that my children would be all kind of grown up. Mm. My youngest would be driving. So I very much hope that driverless cars become a thing in the next 12 <laughs> years. <laughs> so yeah, really happy doing what I'm doing. And let's, let's see where the Lord takes it. Wonderful. Yeah, it sounds great. Is there, and there's no, is there a great vision or is it day to day? How does, how does speak life plan out for you? Yeah, I, I think we've got a five-year plan because we, we kind of think a 12-year plan, who knows? <laughs> you know? Isn't there a bit in the Bible about, you know, <laughs> don't, don't say what you're doing in a year's time because your life is a mist. And yes, our, our life uh, is, is a mist. But our five-year plan is to, is to really grow um, what we're doing in, in terms of making a, a bigger impact on, um, on YouTube. You know, we're, we're currently in the top 1% of you know, YouTube channels. We want to be in the top 1.1% of, of YouTube channels. Why, why not get to a million subscribers? Why not make a, a big splash there? It's currently got uh, two and a half million, two and a half billion monthly users wow. on, on YouTube. So, you know, if it was a country, it's, it's as big as China and India combined. Who are the missionaries? to this sort of digital space and we, we want to be missionaries to that space and see a real impact yeah. so there's there's one thing we'd really like to grow extraordinary yes because because our youtube channel also has two and a half users <laughs> <laughs> is that what you said oh, billion, billion, billion sorry billion, just no no yeah, yeah. it doesn't yeah. Have, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, i'm, I'm yeah. joking it's at least four <laughs> anyway we wish you every blessing wherever yeah. life and the lord may take you glenn and that brings us on to the last segment of the show where we like to think that between us we can provide some significant edification and inspiration for our listeners yes very shortly glenn it will be time for your spiritual pearl of wisdom but just before that it's the part of the show that we call is it true is it true is it true is it true Yes. Is oh, it? man, where's the resolution? <laughs> I'm on edge. Please. That's just a simple fourth. You don't have to resolve from the fourth to the tonic. Very straightforward. <laughs> okay. Yes. Right. Is it true? And this yes. time we would like to enlist your impeccable theological credentials in addressing the assertion that DIY or do it yourself is unexpectedly prominent in the Bible story. Suggesting that God is especially keen that we keep our homes well maintained. Mm. This first came to our attention when studying the book of Zephaniah chapter 2, where God is promising all sorts of destruction, as you will remember, for Israel's neighbours. And alongside him saying things like, Moab shall become a land possessed by nettles and salt pits and a waste forever. And, O Philistines, I will destroy you until no inhabitant is left. Their blood will be poured into the dust. He moves on to what he clearly considers an equally appalling fate and he declares that the cedar panelling will be exposed to the weather mm. then we see that jesus himself despite his ultimate mission of the eternal salvation of all humankind appears to have dedicated most of his life to carpentry in other words not looking after your buildings and woodwork in particular is really poor form and so it is suggested that the need for basic household maintenance is one of the fundamental messages of the bible but, Glenn Scrivener. Is it true? Is it true? Is it true? Is it true? Is, is it, it true? true? <laughs> um, if it is, I'm in a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to do DIY without swearing at the nails and the screws and the hammer. And the, like, like I, a friend of mine uh, helped me assemble a high sleeper bed for my, for my son recently. And I was just astonished by his DIY abilities, his ability just to take each problem just calmly. I've told you, I'm a plate spinner. I'm just like this, now, 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 now. And he's just like, well, we follow the instructions and we go from page three to page four. And once page four is done, we then do page five. And then we are, and it's like, how are you not swearing at these pieces of wood? Just, I don't understand. <laughs> so if DIY is in fact central to uh, godliness, then I am a about the biggest sinner there is. <laughs> it is. Uh, I mean, they're just. But the more you think about it, there's quite a lot of. I mean, we've got trees in the, Genesis, yeah. and we and in Revelation. 
Yes. You've got the, the Ark. I mean, yes. humankind was saved by wood. By, by DIY. Yeah. DIY yeah. saved my life. <laughs> yes, quite literally. Saved so, the world. DIY saved the world. Yes. So yeah. there's quite a lot in there, but it's so, but you think it... Where do you get your ideas from? This is my, this is my question. <laughs> I don't know where he gets his ideas from. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. But um, anyway, there we go. We could, I've got many more examples that I could regale you with, but I shan't at this particular yeah, case. Yeah, research so we, you've done on that. We, we, it's amazing. <laughs> Wasteful. No, I mean, no, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, so we think that's probably not true entirely. It's, it's probably, probably not central to the concerns no. of the Bible. Okay. But, I, you know, I, I want to have a theology of everything. So yes, I'm, I'm, yes. In, I'm in for it. Yeah. Well, Teach me more. Teach it's maybe worth thinking about. And if yeah. any of our listeners want to research that even further, then... Um, don't. <laughs> but uh, anyway, thank you for pointing us in the right direction there, Glenn. And I too am a little relieved because my home maintenance isn't exactly my forte. But um, with that, I'm delighted to confirm it is finally time for your spiritual pearl of wisdom. It's a spiritual pearl of wisdom. Here's something that I uh, talked about yesterday with um, some of the guys here at Speak Life. Uh, John chapter 20, at the very end of my favorite book of the Bible, um, you meet two people, Mary and Thomas. Mary is the world's most ardent believer because at this point, like everyone's fled, all the, all the men are rubbish up in the upper room, cowering away. It's the women who kind of step up to the plate, and she's sort of chief among them. She's the world's most ardent believer, and yet she's full of doubts. She's in a total flap. It's going to end up being the greatest day of her life. But she meets angels, and she's not unaware of it. She bumps into Jesus, and she's unaware of it. She's like, where have you laid him? Have you stolen? Like, she accuses Jesus of having stolen the body of Jesus. Like, she is in an utter flap. So she's the world's most ardent believer, and she's full of doubts. And then later on in John 20, you meet Thomas, who's the world's most famous doubter. You know, poor Thomas, he had a week of doubting. <laughs> and henceforward, billions of people for 2,000 years have called him Doubting Thomas. You know, like Peter was racist for a bit <laughs> in Galatians chapter 2. We don't call him racist Peter, but doubting, Th Thomas had his doubts for, for a week. And then his doubts were allayed by Jesus. And he says, my Lord and my God. And so Doubting Thomas believes. And it's fascinating to me that the most ardent believer in the world has doubts. And the most famous doubter in the world ends up believing. And I ask my friends all the time, are you a believer or not? And the answer to that question is always both. Always. You know, am I a believer? Yeah. But do I get in a flap? You betcha. Do I have doubts? Yes, I do. Are you a doubter? Yes, I am. Does that, does that mean you can never believe? No, of course you can believe. And what do both Mary and Thomas need they need to they need to encounter jesus and the very end of of john's gospel at the end of that chapter it says john john says these things i've written down so that you can believe and when he says you he's talking about everyone you know he's not just using the you singular it's the you plural i've written these things down so that you might believe and go on believing that's the sense of the original that he's writing down so i need to believe in jesus again today because I might be the world's most ardent believer or I might be the world's most famous doubter. Um, I'm going to be in a flap today. I'm going to make a mess of everything. I need to believe in Jesus again and again and again. And all oh, good news. Here's John's gospel, for instance, or any part of the Bible, or I can go to church or I can have fellowship with other Christians and just be reminded of the Jesus story again and again and again and again. Because I need to believe every single day. Because am I a believer? Yeah. Am I a doubter? Yeah. But it's Jesus who actually reveals himself to me in a life-giving way. I just need to put myself in the way of Jesus. It's a spiritual of wisdom. Well, thank you very much for that, Glenn. And the end of the show is so near, but yet so far. Because one thing stands in our way. And that is the monstrosity that is... Simon's Random Question. 
Simon, what's your random question for Glenn? <laughs> well, Glenn, I was relieved that you didn't choose a goat as your non-domesticated animal at your dinner party because that would have just caused chaos. But if you were to receive a gift that rhymed with goat, what would you most like it to be? I'd like a boat. Yeah, is, is that what you wanted me to say? No. Well, it could be many things. Anything, it? whatever you could like. Right. Okay. A boat would be nice. I think that's yeah. Okay. Okay. Because a coat, throat, float. Okay. All these oh, things. Yeah. A groat. A groat. A groat. A stoat. Yeah, if you want a stoat. To be... Yeah. A stoat would a be. A compote. Nice. <laughs> that's cool. What yeah. about a moat? A moat would be good because someone would have to give you a castle before they. Would they it, have to? They? Yes. Because because uh, if they didn't give me the castle, I. Definitely don't want the moat. No. 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 So I'm going to go for a boat. Although they, they do boat. say that, you know, the best the best two days if you ever own a boat are the day you buy it and then the day you sell really? it again. Okay. Yes, yeah. they do. It would be rather nice to have a boat, though. Yeah, it would be nice to have a boat. Especially here. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> too much DIY. Okay. No, thanks. Oh, yes. Far too much DIY. It's a lot of maintenance. Mm -hmm. A lot of winter oh, painting absolutely. going on, okay. isn't there? I might yeah. have gone for coat actually, but I probably ought to get mine actually, hadn't I? Yes, I think it's probably time. But <laughs> time, no, to time. be fair, to be fair, that wasn't such a bad question. And actually, I think specifying <laughs> <laughs> wasn't terrible. Wasn't terrible. Wasn't terrible. Well uh, Thank I, you. I think specifying gifts by an animal that they must rhyme with could actually be quite fun. Imagine a wedding, for example, where everyone had to give the happy couple something that rhymed with, say, elephant. Hmm. Yeah. No, that wouldn't really that wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't. Uh, Anyway, anyway, in any case, that was. <laughs> So, Glenn, I'm sure that that is as much intellectual stimulation as any of our listeners need for now. <laughs> so we'd better draw stumps, as they say. Ooh. It's been splendid chatting with you. Thank you for having us and thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. And dear listeners, thank you for joining us again. Or perhaps for the first time. Although, in which case, where have you been? And welcome to the Take A Pew family. In any case, we would really appreciate it if you haven't already, if you could subscribe to the show on YouTube or on our podcast platform. Thank you. Simon and I will be back with more fun, faith and flights of fancy very soon. But in the meantime, it's Toodle Pit from me. And Tatty Bye from me. Join us again next time as we take a pew. To be honest, that's almost too much resolution. If I'm, <laughs> if I was to be picky, <laughs> no, I love that. I love that. Um, my spiritual pearl of wisdom. Um...